Why do we have leaders in the church? Why is it necessary for a few people to hold positions of power? Couldn't God alone make all the decisions? After all, his members are his people, his family. That might have been the case had Adam and Eve not sinned, but their sin introduced chaos into our earthly relationships, and dealing with chaos requires us to establish order, which does not naturally happen within a group of individuals without a leader. Sometimes the task of leadership is to divide an overwhelming amount of labor, as Moses did when he appointed judges to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens in Exodus 18.21. When the nation of Israel needed deliverance from oppressors, God chose judges to lead them. Jesus himself chose apostles, both during his earthly life and after his resurrection, who would found the entire church, Ephesians 2.20. After Christ's ascension, the apostles immediately became pastors to 3,000 new Christians, a number that grew rapidly in the days and weeks after Pentecost. Through, read throughout the book of Acts. Soon, the apostles became so overwhelmed with administration that they didn't have time for their true spiritual calling, prayer, and the ministry of the word, Acts 6-4. The apostles asked the Jerusalem church to select seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, Acts 6-3, who could take care of logistical matters like the distribution of food, which was just as important as preaching, but needed to be separate jobs. At that point, the early church had two categories of leaders, apostles and ministers, or servers. No label is applied to them in Acts. The apostles were concerned with oversight, seeking spiritual direction for the body of Christ in prayer and also proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the seven ser servers focused on managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the church. Once the church began to spread, Paul appointed elders and deacons to oversee local churches and to take care of their spiritual and physical needs. In addition, Paul appointed some of his protégés to provide interim leadership in the new congregations, thus carrying those new assemblies forward. These ministers all had three qualifications. They had to be reputable, spirit-filled, and wise, Acts 6.3, since they would be responsible for correcting moral impurity, maintaining order in worship, and rejecting heresy, 1 Corinthians 5.1-5 and 9-11, 14.26-35, and 1.3-4. In 1 Timothy 3.1-7 and Titus 1.5-9, Paul details the qualifications for elders or overseers. Qualifications for deacons and their wives are found in 1 Timothy 3, 8-13. Churches were expected to use these lists as they appointed leaders in every city where new congregations were established. Titus 1, 5. These elders, according to Paul, needed to be established in the faith and blameless, not perfect, but free from scandal and condemnation in their personal and family lives. Titus, I mean, 1 Timothy 3, 2-7. They were also responsible for the teaching and preaching in the church. 1 Timothy 3 2. Activities necessary for combating false teaching. As the churches matured, their leaders and positions of leadership became established. The writer to Heath the Hebrews suggests that the churches that would receive his letter were being shepherded by second generation leaders. Hebrews 13 17. Now, many churches after the first installation of church leaders, churches still need godly shepherds who can not only preach and defend the gospel, but who will faithfully serve the flock, ever mindful that they serve under the good shepherd who tenderly cares for his own. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 4. The health of the church is the most, is in the midst of a hostile world, depends on the quality of its leadership.